Good afternoon. My name is Carlos Crespo. You probably have heard that before. Uh, but I uh, want to, I've been told to keep going and make sure we stay on, on track here. Uh, our next part of the program is a panel uh, discussion. Uh, the topic of the next panel is changing the face of power, uh, demystifying what it means to run for office. This is a, a very important question because we've been talking about why. Uh, here's the how. So uh, it is a, a great uh, pleasure for me to introduce to you the uh, moderator of this panel. Uh, her name is Beverly Stein. She's Director of Research and Development for the National Policy Consensus Center at Portland State University. Beverly is the director of the research and development for the National Policy Consensus Center. Before that, she was president and co-owner of the Public Strategies Group, a consulting firm working with leaders at all levels of government. She has served as an elected chair of Multnomah County Board of County Commissioners and was the chief executive for eight years. In that position, she administered a government with 5,000 employees and a billion, with a B, uh, dollar budget. Multnomah County won the Oregon Quality Award based on Baldrige criteria in 1999, and Stein was designated by government, Governing Magazine as the local official, official of the year with Portland Mayor Vera Katz in 1996. A wealth of experience. She was selected three times to serve in the Oregon House of Representatives. That's not an easy task, and we have some representative here today. She worked as a legal aid attorney and in solo private uh, law practice. She also has extensive experience as a strategic planner and facilitator, and I have benefited greatly from that experience in other projects, so she's very good at that. And she also ran for governor in Oregon in the 2002 uh, primary. So it is my honor and a real pleasure to introduce to you Beverly Stein as the moderator of the next panel. Thank you. Thank you very much for the kind introduction. Much too long, but um, you don't know what's going to happen when people introduce you. Um, I am very honored to be here. Um, I was when Jessica had asked me, I work with Jessica, and when she asked me to do this, I, I felt like, oh, what an honor to be able to uh, work with your group and to be able to just facilitate a panel that will encourage people to run for office because it's a very, it's a wonderful position to operate from. There are many ways of having power in society, but being an elected official really has some extra power that is really helpful in advancing the agendas that I know that you're all concerned about. So um, what I'm going to do is introduce our panel, and then we have some questions for them. And they aren't pop, it's not a pop quiz. They have actually seen the questions. So um, <laughs> they hopefully are prepared to be brief. Um, and my job, I think my only job here is to keep them under control from talking too much. So beware, I will be doing that. <laughs> so um, first of all, we have um, at the far left, um, Olga Acuna who is a City of Hillsborough Councilor and um, was appointed to the City Council in January of 2008. She's uh, in her second term, is that right? Correct. All right. And uh, has lived in Hillsborough since 1980. Um, she is, um, serves on the plan served on the planning committee for Liberty High School and was chosen to begin the Office of Hispanic Outreach in the Hispanic uh, School District. So she has both a, a role as an elected official and in the school, uh, the school district in a very important kind of way. Uh, she has a master's degree in special education from Portland State and a school uh, administrator credential from Lewis and Clark. Um, so she's now the Director of Federal Programs and Parent and Community Engagement at the Hillsborough School District. So would you uh, welcome her? <laughs> Next, we have Joe Gallegos, who is a state representative and, uh, in Hill, from Hillsboro. Uh, he, he grew up um, in some sort of hard times, but education is what had pulled him out, and he's still an educator now. Um, 
And so he was in the Air Force in the Vietnam era and then worked in the shipyards and um, is now running a small business and has taught college for over 30 years. He is a nationally recognized expert on the area of aging and uh, the struggles that elderly and their families have to overcome as well as their services. So please welcome Joe. <laughs> Next, we have Jessica Vega-Peterson, also a state representative, um, recently elected. She was the first Latina elected to the uh, Oregon House, and we, we, she won't be the last, right? Um, she uh, championed investments in children and uh, a Senate bill which established the driver's cards in Oregon. So she took leadership in her first term. That's really excellent. Uh, she graduated from Loyola University in Chicago in informational systems and spent 14 years working primarily with Microsoft on technology issues. Um, she served on a number of boards and uh, let's give her a, a warm welcome also. And last but not least, my friend Serena Cruz Walsh, who I served on the Board of County Commissioners with, so I'm delighted to have her here. Her job now is as executive director of the Virginia Garcia Memorial Foundation. And she previously was a co-founder of the Albina Construction Company, which built and renovated sustainable and affordable housing with her husband. And she served eight years as a Multnomah County Commissioner. And she's now on the board of NOW. And um, she has a bachelor's from Lewis and Clark, a master's of public policy from the John F. Kennedy School of Government at Harvard and a JD, a law degree from the University of California, Berkeley. She's well over-educated. Um, <laughs> let's give her a, uh, a round of applause. OK, so the first question I'm going to ask each of you to answer the same question, and then I'm going to bounce around with different questions so it doesn't get boring, OK, for you or me or them. <laughs> Um, so the first question, though, is a really important one um, that as they talk about it, think about yourself because everyone in here is a potential elected official. So think about what you might do. Um, and the question is, what motivated you to run for office? So Serena, would you start? Sure. Thank you, Bev. And it, thank you so much for inviting me to join on this panel today. And it's such a pleasure to have Bev as a moderator. I told her that I always reference her whenever I talk about running for office. So it's really nice that you'll be here when I talk about that. Um, well, the, the first time that I thought uh, that I would want to run for office someday was really when I had interned in former Governor Goldschmidt's office. Um, I was writing press releases to announce all of the people who got nominated got to think about um, being a part of this process that brings issues to the table um, so that we could represent issues about the feminization of poverty. You know, why are, why are, are, are women and children growing up in poverty at increasingly? For, or, uh, who was holding the position of state representative decided um, not to run again in that position. Um, and I started saying, okay, well now we need to find a good person. We need to find somebody who understands East Portland, who lives there, who's raising their family there, who, you know, who understands what we need and can be that voice for us. And so I started talking to a couple people uh, if they were interested and they turned around and said, why don't you run? And I, um, so first of all, always be careful if you're gonna ask somebody to run or do anything because then they'll just turn around and ask if you're gonna do it. Um, but, but that was the first time that I actually thought about doing it as a job. and and maybe even thinking about it, it was something that I could do now. As a mother of a uh, three and a half year old and an 18 month old at that point, this is something that I could handle, but I thought, why not? Because if I'm not gonna do it, um, who's gonna do it? And are they, gonna, are they gonna be that voice? Are they gonna be strong enough? Well, I believe in that. And I thought, you know, and it's a, it's a little bit like Marisa said, if you're not gonna, if you don't, think that somebody's going to be doing it, then you have to do it. And if you know you could do a good job, then you have to do it. There's no excuse not to. Um, and so then, you know, I decided to go for it. And, um, and it's been amazing. But it was something that, you know, you had to f I had to figure out, like, there's no perfect time to run for office. There's always going to be a reason not to do it. But sometimes you just have to take that leap because um, the job itself and what you're going to be able to do is bigger than yourself and bigger than just you. Great. Thanks, Jessica. Joe? I'm not sure which one to use here. Um, hi, I, I, I guess, you know, that, that question really, for me, really starts way back in um, 
for some of you who don't know, my family was one of the first settled out migrant families here in Portland. And, um, you know, we had a pretty uh, um, up and down life. Um, so as a result, I went to like 10 different grade schools as a kid here in Portland. And we were always moving into low income housing and so on every time we came back out of the fields. Um, so my experience was very different than all of the other kids, you know, it was very um, uh, marginalized, I guess, to say. I, I, I first got, uh, 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 well, I got in a lot of uh, difficulties as a kid because of all of that kind of stuff. But I think when I got to high school, finally I connected with uh, a teacher and a counselor and uh, got involved in high school uh, government. And from there, I think uh, I, it was into the 70s, and I was at Portland State in the early 70s, and the Chicano movement had just really started. And one of my first assignments was to start the Chicano Student Union there at Portland State. So that was where I sort of becoming really much more involved in politics. I uh, ran for office at, the, at my graduate school and was the president of, of the student body there. So, you know, early on, began to get very political, also becoming very aware of my Latino heritage. And um, after, after my uh, graduate program, uh, master's degree in social work, I ended up in Mount Angel and um, <clears throat> with some other Latinos, and we ended up creating a college down there. And actually, because of my experience in terms of social policy, was able to get that college accredited. And I guess it's important to me because Back then, I remember writing the grant that got that college funded. And that grant, uh, the reason we got the, 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 the funding was because 50% of our Latino kids were not getting out of high school. So that's in 1975. Um, so even, even after that, I mean, I went on and got my doctorate mainly because I wanted to be an advocate on behalf of the community. And um, so I, I did that, got, it, got my PhD, uh, learned how to do research and became a professor, uh, and I've done a lot of research. Uh, I've done field research in Mexico. I wanted to go to Mexico and understand what is it that's driving sort of the workforce issues down in, in Mexico and, and, and all of that. So uh, I spent a, a career being involved in that kind of research. I've been, um, I've created a number of, of agencies, Consejo up in Seattle, which is, or Washington, I should say, which is a mental health agency for Latinos. Uh, so Colegio Cerro Chavez, uh, Consejo, and a couple of agencies here in Portland. But I guess what I'm getting at is, so there's been a whole lifetime of service that comes through in terms of education, in terms of public service, and so on. Um, I would say that, that sort of the final uh, thing that, that drove me into office, I would say, is that I also was involved, and there's a couple of folks out here who are, were involved with the American Leadership Forum, and the American Leadership Forum is an organization that's dedicated to a couple of things. One, collaborative leadership and making the, recognizing the value of diversity and, and how do we use diversity um, uh, effectively. So with that, uh, when the opportunity came up in, in my district, um, the person who was running for office dropped out. And so again, they were looking for someone and I raised my hand and so, uh, in 12 weeks, we ran a campaign and I got elected, so I just finished my first uh, session in Salem. Thank, Thank you. you, Joe. Yep. Thank you. Olga. Um, for me, I'm an educator at heart. I consider myself a, an educator and, and an advocate for, the, for civil rights. And I have been in education for a little bit over 20 years. I started Can everybody out hear her? I think you need to get a little closer. To okay. I started um, as a teacher in the Hillsborough School District uh, in the early 90s. I taught for about 12 years. My passion, like I said, has always been um, education. Um, uh, I started, well, you know, at the be beginning of my career, educate, you know, teaching career, um, started working with families, with parents. I started noticing that the parent engagement in the school systems was lacking. Uh, parent advocacy, especially for Latino students, was lacking. And so I started, I started mobilizing that, uh, that community, working with parents, uh, teaching them about their rights, about how to be engaged in, 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 this, in the uh, education system. Um, 
And so with that, I started, uh, you know, educating myself uh, in regards to, you know, how can I make a, a greater influence? How can I empower the parents? What are, what are the skills that I could need to continue to learn so that I could do that? I also learned uh, quickly that um, a lot of my families were moving slowly in terms of engaging and advocating. And, and so I started believing that I needed to be you know, with them and I needed to do some of that advocacy. So I went back to school and pursued my you know, administrative uh, license, uh, went uh, back and I pursued my uh, you know, ESL endorsements and additional teaching endorsements and, and things like that. And so, always wanting to do more, I found ways to engage myself at the community level. Being, you know, I became involved with the Vision uh, 2020 in Hillsboro. Uh, I joined the committees outside of the Hillsboro School District, and I just, you know, made myself known in that way. My my inspiration, my whole goal was to bring more to our parents. Was to reach out to community organizations and services and. Uh, resources that my parents could benefit from. And so that's how I met Tom Hughes. He was here earlier and um, one day there was an opening on city council and uh, one of the councilors was leaving and they needed uh, to appoint someone for a year. That was me. Um, you know, I hardly ever say no to, to things and I'm, I'm learning <laughs> to say no and so uh, I said no. Uh, no, no, I said yes. I said, <laughs> Good practicing. Yeah. yeah, I said yes, and so there I was, uh, new to politics. New, you know, it was uh, you know my life was taking a new spin, and, and I was realizing that man, there's a hell of a lot more that I need to learn about just life and about what's out there. And so um, I served for a year, and when it was. Uh, Time came up, you know, to to run for city council. I put my name on the ballot, and I was um, I ran unopposed. I was lucky and fortunate, and so <laughs> I did it. Uh, when my first term ended, um, I ran again. And the reason I ran again was because I didn't see anyone interested, another person of color or another Latino interested in taking on that role. And so I felt like I have to do it. I just have to do it again. And so I put my name on the ballot again, and here I am, you know, uh, <laughs> finishing my second term. I have two years left, and I'm a little worried because I need to find a replacement. So <laughs> any of you out there that's interested to move to Hillsboro, if you're not already in Hillsboro, please <laughs> check in with me. <laughs> okay, great, thank you. So, um, So now I'm going to pick on different ones. So Jessica, this one's for you. Um, so the question is, what experiences in, in your life have prepared you to run for office and to serve? And I want you to distinguish between the two things, because I think one of the things we know, those of us who have run for office know that running for office is one set of skills, and being an elected official is another set of skills. So if you could comment on what prepared you for both of those roles, which you kind of have to play. Yeah, no, that's a really important distinction, because there's there's running and there's serving. Um, so I'm going to start with the serving first. What, like serving as a, as a state representative. So I would say this, um, every experience I had in life helped prepare me to serve as a legislature. And I think that is really important because um, there's a lot of, um, there's a lot of self-doubt about if you're, if you are the right person for this, if you, have it in you to, to serve in office. And I'm telling you that the perspectives that each of us have and each of us bring are an important voice to have when you're talking about policy that affects every Oregonian. And so that's why we need more folks to run for office. So, you know, come, being a woman, being a mother, being a Latina, being um, somebody who worked in the business industry, like all of these different um, uh, facets of who I am so informs the work that I do in the legislature, whether it's the, the issues that I'm focusing on or it's just the voice that I'm bringing in the conversation. And uh, especially, I think, as at the state level, we work on so many different issues. 
We work on everything from education to public safety and corrections to environmental issues to economic development and transportation issues. There is such a wide variety of things that, that you can find um, things that you're passionate about, that you're informed at, um, that you care about healthcare. You know, that's a huge one too. So, so I think that, you know, from, the, from serving um, who you are um, and just any experience you have is going to be able to, to um, help um, you have a, have a strong, unique voice in shaping the policy. Now, in running for office, that is a different thing because that's all about putting yourself out there. It's about asking people for money. It's about talking about yourself. And it's about talking about the issues that are important to you. And that is a set of skills um, that it's, it's very rare, I think, to find people, somebody who has all of those skills, right? You're not, I mean, that's why I think training, organ, uh, training um, political and candidate training programs are really important because they help you know some of the me mechanics of what you need to do. Um, but so any kind of public speaking experience you can have, I mean, I think um, serving on community boards and serving as a volunteer on things um, has been very helpful. For me, um, being a Democratic precinct com committee person in my neighborhood for several years before I decided to run for office helps me have um, good community connections that served me well when I was running for office. Um, and there's um, absolutely nothing that I had done that prepared me for asking people for money. It was like the worst thing. It's the worst thing. Um, but it's something that you have to do when you run for office, so you just kind of go through with it. Um, but it is because of the um, volunteering and working on issues that I cared about that allowed me to say, you know, it's not, it's, it's investing in me, and, but it's also investing in the things that I want to accomplish when I get there, and so that, that helps with that. Great, thank you. Serena, this one's for you. So, uh, what surprised you about serving as an elected official? That's a good one for me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Bev, Bev got to see me when I was a brand new elected official, and I was quite young. So I didn't actually have a lot of self-doubt, which I think was one of my challenges <laughs> um, when I took when I was elected to office. So I think the thing that surprised me the most was learning how to operate from the inside of the building instead of from the outside of places. Um, frequently, if you're a person of color or you're a woman, you, you have to find your way around systems, and you don't think that systems are there to, built for you. Um, and so, and I also just had a very strong sense of what was right and what was wrong, and what I believed was right and what everybody else believed was wrong. So I had to, <laughs> had to learn the art of compromise. <laughs> Um, I had to learn the art of, and it's not that much of an art, it's really easy, count to three. <laughs> three means you get what you, you get what you want, or you get some part of what you want if you get those votes. It's a lot easier in local government than it is in the legislature. Um, I'm really happy I started, I, I, I worked in local government because three is, is a lot easier to get to. So I think for me, um, some of my challenges were, you know, cultivating those relationships and learning how to um, persuade folks about the kinds of things that mattered that I wanted their support on, and then supporting them on the kinds of things that mattered to them so that we all moved our agendas forward was an important um, thing for me to learn. It sounds really basic, but uh, I think for me, it really hit, and I felt like I, I hit a stride in my second term, not in my first term, that it was just um, so much more of a struggle about feeling like I, it was such an important thing that I had to make sure this voice was loud and clearly heard. And um, being effective is critically important as well. So I think that was um, one of my big surprises. Thank you. A little transparency there. Um, <laughs> so Joe, um, what what are some challenges that you've experienced in your political life now as an elected official, and how have you overcome those challenges? Challenges. Um, well, I, I think not not really knowing what to expect. I think so. <laughs> getting down to Salem and sort of uh, getting on a fast track to really learn uh, what it is to be a legislator. But I think also it, it's interesting. I think that uh, the comment Jessica made about the difference between campaigning and being in Salem, um, which I, I, I can really relate to the issue around asking for money. I, um, I, I've been on many boards, nonprofit boards, and as part of that responsibility, often we would have to get on the phone and, and call people and ask for money for campaigns or whatever. I always had a hard time asking for money like that. 
<clears throat> but when it came to my campaign and for me calling and asking for money for me, I had no problem at all. It was very easy. <laughs> but the thing is, the money really doesn't come to me. It really goes to the campaign, and it really is about getting, getting uh, a candidate elected. So somehow it was, was part of the job, and it wasn't so bad. But um, I think the, the, the first challenge that I had, I mean, you got to appreciate, I retired in 2011 from University of Portland. And I thought I was uh, going to go fishing and take it easy. And, <laughs> and then they, they came and asked me to run, and I raised my hand and got it mistaken. But uh, so they, they, they took this old guy who'd never run for office before and uh, uh, made him a candidate, and, and with 12 weeks to go, not a, not a full year of, of campaigning. And then they, they brought in a 20 year old uh, woman from uh, uh, Pennsylvania, uh, and uh, she was my campaign manager. So you gotta appreciate it. I've been th teaching for 30, 40 years and I've been telling 20 year olds what to do. <laughs> and here, here a, as a candidate, the campaign manager tells the candidate what to do. And uh, so it was really kind of a turnaround. So that was pretty challenging, but it worked out fine. I got elected and, and now I have another great ca uh, campaign manager and, and uh, we're, we're headed for a win as well. So I think that was uh, an initial challenge. I think then the second challenge was when I got to Salem, uh, again, you know, I mean, I'm a, I'm a professor. I, I, I talk kind of slow and I kind of go like this because I'm always thinking, what does the research say? I don't want to say something wrong to my students and then have them laugh at me. So I've got to be very careful about is there research to back up what I'm saying? And that's, that's very much a professor, right? But you get down there and, 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 and that's not the way it is. I mean, you, you speak in sound bites. You, talk in, in uh, uh, stories about you know such and such and so and so. Anyway, it's very different. Uh, so that was another challenge for me to really learn how to, how to uh, address issues differently down there. Great, yep. thank you. Uh, Olga, uh, question for you is, how have you worked as an elected official in collaboration with community organizations? So in thinking about my, how I represent uh, a community, I'm always, oh, I said earlier, it's hard for me to say no. So I'm always approached by executive directors of different nonprofits, uh, different boards, different committees. Hey, we need representation from this sector of the community. Uh, would you please consider joining? And as a result of that, I, I find myself everywhere. You know, uh, not only within the Hillsborough School District, being on, on planning boards with you know curriculum development committees. But uh, uh, as a city councilor, I represent and um, you know budget committees, transportation committees. Um, the, I'm on the new Vision uh, 2035 planning uh, committee, and um, you know, I just uh, appointed myself. Uh, I don't. I haven't uh, received an answer yet, but on the uh, Human Rights Council for Washington County, mm -hmm. and so um, earlier in my political career, I was reflecting on, you know, do I prioritize and do I just involve myself in two or three of those uh, committees and, and, and boards um, because I was getting so many requests. Later, I realized that my voice needs to be heard um, everywhere and the, and the reason why I feel that it needs to be heard is because I need to bring more people to the board. I need more people's voices to be considered. And the only way that I can make that happen is if I educate people around me around the need to reach out to those communities that are marginalized, that are not represented. And so, you know, with that said, I am fortunate that we have, you know, slowly, but it's been happening where we, you know, we now have a Latina on the Hillsborough School uh, Board, and we've never had a, you know, a person of color before. And so, you know, I find myself coaching and, and advocating for um, leaders um, of color and appoint, you know, ab appointing leaders of color. I was appointed, and if I w wouldn't have been appointed for that one year, I don't think I would be here now. Mm -hmm. So we need to give uh, mentor and give our you know, influential uh, community members opportunities to take on those leadership roles. So. You know, it, it is challenging, it is lonely out there sometimes, being the only person of color on council, but 
I have to stay the course. And that's the same thing that I tell my students, same thing that I tell my friends, stay the course and never give up. There's a reason why we're doing what we're doing. Great. Thank you. So uh, Jessica, what's, what surprised you about uh, serving an elected office? So there's, um, so there's two things that surprised me. One is how much I love the job. Um, I didn't think I was going to like it so much, mm -hmm. and I absolutely love this work. Um, and, and it's nice because there's a lot of, it's really busy, it's really stressful. You, there's a million things coming at you at once. Um, but I, but, so there's, there's a lot to not like, but I, I just love the work that and the opportunities that I have just as, a, as serving an elected office. Um, I think the second thing was, I think it's the same thing about like working inside the building versus outside the building. You kind of see things from the outside about um, how you think bills become laws or how you think you know people talk about issues or, or make decisions about issues. But when you're inside there and you really see um, what happens um, in the discussions people have about what things are going to go forward and what, what's not and what the timing of things are. Um, it, it's, it's that insider perspective that um, I didn't have coming from the business industry and not being, a, uh, um, not being you know, involved in politics or doing a lot um, as a, as a um, campaign person or a lobby person before. Um, and, it's, and so I think it's um, the importance of knowing how the system works and how to get your voice inserted into that process so that the priorities that you have are going to get are going to get um, passed. Great, thank you. So, Serena, um, what are some of the challenges you experienced when you were in political life, and how did you overcome them? Um, I think uh, one of my biggest challenges uh, was figuring out how to work with the press. <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> not always, um, not always my strength. And so, um, I think that uh, learning. So, you're obviously under a microscope when you're in public life, um, and depending on where you're at, um, for, for whatever reason we were at that time at the county. Um, and I think that uh, I learned, I, I learned a lot by making mistakes. I don't know about the rest of you. I wish I could always learn by other people's experiences, but I tend to <laughs> learn by making mistakes. Um, and so I had some bad press and it, you know, it stuck with me. And one of the things that I had to learn um, was how to not let that image of me that was being portrayed in the press be me, because it wasn't, um, and how to move my issues and my work. And so it's a constant, it was a constant effort. I don't know that um, I would say I was completely successful in doing that, because I think there were countless times when me and my colleagues tried very hard to talk about the positive work that we were doing when all the press wanted to write about was negative. Um, and so I think it is critical though to stay positive. I think it's um, important to build those relationships with the press. Um, and uh, I think it's important to always keep in mind what it is you are trying to move and you are trying to get done and be on that message and be on that point. So with respect to the press, I feel like mm -hmm. that's one thing I learned. Good something point. about. Um, so, um, Olga, yes. what, um, what, what experiences in your life prepared you to run for office and then to serve that, those two different uh, tasks that we've talked about? My experiences as an, a school administrator uh, and the work that I, that I did to uh, bring communities together, to organize communities within the education system, I felt uh, prepared me. However, um, being on council was a whole new ball game. <laughs> um, I, you know, another reason why I, I ran again for a second term is because I was just barely getting to understand the systems and how, you know, how to, you know, advocate for, for issues and, and how to fight for issues and, you know, um, really how to understand the whole political process. I was not a politician. An educator is not a politician. And so I felt that, you know, I'm, I'm just not done learning. And, um, and I'm not done learning. My, my term, I'll be termed out in two years. Uh, I have some, you know, aspirations to, to continue to, um, you know, do other things, run for commissioner at the county level, maybe at the state level. Uh, so I'm looking in, in that direction right now. Great. Okay, Joe, um, what are some examples of how you've worked with community organizations collaboratively as an elected official? Sure. Um, 
I should mention that as a professor, I mean, the, cor the courses I would teach as, as a uh, professor were community organizing, community development, uh, social policy. But I can tell you that uh, doing it is very different than teaching it. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, you know, um, so that's been quite an experience and I, I really enjoyed it. Uh, and, and I frankly enjoyed testing myself whether or not what I taught in, in my classes was really true or not. Uh, <laughs> But, you know, I think an example, I'm on the uh, uh, human, service at human Services and Housing Committee, and uh, I was sort of assigned the housing piece of it. And as such, I had to work then with the Director of Housing, and, and they were taking on a monumental task of reshuffling, re reorganizing housing for the state of Oregon. And part of that housing program is also what's called the Community Action Programs, which came out of sort of the poverty program. And um, so the Community Action Programs uh, are part of the housing agency. And anyway, it's a very complicated mix of services. So I had to work very closely with the housing people as well as community action people. And, uh, you know, they have different agendas. But uh, again, what, what's fun is to see where the commonality lies where people can work together, find that, that, that common sort of goal. Okay, great. So now this next question, I would like each of you to answer this question, and then we'll open up for questions from the audience. So be thinking about the kind of things you want to know from these folks. So what advice would you give Latinos interested in running for office? So, so why don't we start at this end, Serena? Okay. Um, well, the first one is, uh, to run for office. I mean, I think, I think so often um, for, we do need to be asked, lots of us, like, like women, um, people of color, we like to be asked to run, and that's great, but if you have at all an inclination, talk about it. Um, by talking about what you're interested in someday doing, you'll build relationships that people will help you figure out how to do it. And if somebody does say to you, I think you should run for office, you should think about it. You should listen to it. Um, it's real. And then I'm going to share a bit of advice that Bev gave me um, that I felt was that I always come back to and that I always talk to people about when they say that they're interested in running for office. Bev told me once um, that I should think about that office that I'm interested in running for as a coat. And so if I wanted to be on city council, I should think about myself as a city commissioner and put on a coat that made me Voila, a city commissioner. <laughs> no campaign required. <laughs> and then if I was that city commissioner, how would that coat feel? Was it tight? Was it fitting right? Was it loose? Like, what did I need to do so that it did fit right? Did I need to work on my speaking skills? Did I need to work on my relationships with particular communities? Did I need, what, what did I need to do so that being there would feel right? How would I act differently? She encouraged me to actually try acting like I was a city commissioner. And what would that, what would you do differently and how would that feel? And I really think that that exercise is a really important one. It, it I think I understand it better now than I did at the time. Again, I'm a slow learner. Um, but I, I, uh, I think it's such an important vis visual piece to, 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 it's, there's so many things you can do in your life with your, with your interest in changing the world. There's so many different things you can do. Politics is one of them. And if you do it, you ought, to, you ought to choose that time when it's the right seat, the right time for you. Um, and lots of people can help you think through all those different things, why it would be the right seat, the right time for you. But really thinking about yourself there and what you would do and what it would mean will help you design an agenda so that you are articulate about your vision for the community when you're campaigning. Will help you when you're there, already have thought about those relationships that you need to build to be successful. So I think that piece of advice was a very important one. Thank you. No, thank you. So, Jessica. Okay, I like that about the coat. Um, <laughs> I think um, for me, uh, coming in new, like even before I could think about trying on a coat, would be learning about what coats are out there. <laughs> um, because, I mean, you don't know, um, because there's a, there's a big difference. You, know, you don't know what you don't know, exactly. It's the best advice. Um, but you don't, um, but there's a lot of different things to consider with different offices. It's um, who you represent, 
and what the schedule of the job is like. Are you gonna have to commute? How much does the job pay? How is that gonna affect you and your family? Um, so there's a whole bunch of different facts. I mean, do you even get paid at all? Like school board and a lot of commissions, you don't get paid for that. So how, how will that affect your time and your ability to, to be, fulfill that job? Um, so I think you have to, to learn, and that's just about asking questions. It's about seeking out those people who do hold the, those offices um, and, uh, and, and asking questions. So I think that's, a, that's, a, that's the first step. Um, second is to, if there is a, a program um, that teaches you about, um, well, we'll talk, talk to those people and find out what that job is like, and then, um, and then see which one is the best fit for you. And then, um, and then get the training. I'm a really big believer in education in all fronts, and I think that if you, if you can learn how to, um, what it's gonna take in terms of the skills that you need in order to run for office, um, so seek out the opportunities of either a mentorship or, or an organized training person to do that. Um, and then I think that, um, and this is no matter what you run for, um, think about your own story that you have to tell and why, what is your motivation for running for office? Why do you want to serve and how, how is your story going to be able to connect you with the people whose vote you're asking for, whose money you're asking for, um, and, and how that informs the, 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 what you want to accomplish. And so, because being able to tell that story um, share your story is one of the most powerful ways you'll have when you're when you're a candidate and you're you're asking people to support you. Great, thank you, Bill. Thank you. Um, I have to tell you, I, I really love strong women, and I'm just honored to be up here with these these ladies. Um, you know, and, and I guess I, I say that because I think what's important is is, is you know the things that have been said uh, about leadership and about you know uh, assuming leadership roles, but. I would want to uh, emphasize how important it is not to give up yourself in that process and really recognize your values, your heritage, your culture. And uh, as I said, it does, becoming a leader doesn't mean you have to give those up. What it, what it does mean is that you really get in touch with those, you value those, you value diversity and recognize that you have so much to offer that diversity out there. Um, so th you know that that's what I would say. How do we how do we stay who we are, and and still be effective out there? Um, and so again, I would encourage you to sort of do a lot of self introspection. Olga, two things come to mind. Um, one is don't allow systems to use you as the token. Latino or Latina to speak on issues for Latino community without allowing the Latino community to speak their voice, to, sp to speak about their issues. <laughs> Being the only Latina in council doesn't mean I can speak for all the Latinos in Hillsborough. Our Latino community is very diverse and is representative of very many different subcultures and so we need to hear their voices and so when people come to me you know the mayor or other uh, counselors or other uh, you know city hall administrators so what do you what do you think we should do about um, you know our parks in in, in in a way that are, they're welcome into the Latino community I don't know let's go ask them I can help you but I can't speak for them and so that's one um, two as, as a person of color being, you know, perhaps the only one in, in many of the committees or, or uh, com commissions or boards, um, it takes energy, it takes time, it takes a lot out of you. Balance your life. Figure out how you're gonna prioritize the time that you're putting into the work that you're doing, your own work, because don't expect to get rich being on, you know, uh, an official being on council, it doesn't get, it doesn't pay. And so you, you actually spend a little bit more money being those, you know, you buy your fame. <laughs> and so, uh, but you know, in, retru in return, you get a lot because your community is benefiting from the work that you're doing. Um, balance your life, spend time with your family, spend time with your dog. <laughs> spend, you know, spend, spend time with your friends and spend time with yourself. I have been telling people lately, I have an appointment with myself at seven o'clock tonight. 
I got to go bike riding. You know? <laughs> I, so take care of yourself because you need that energy. You need to be uh, visible. You need to be present. You need to be present when you're attending a three-hour long council meeting that ends at midnight. You need to be present. So that's critical. Your health is, is important. Great. Wonderful advice from all these folks. <clears throat> Okay, let's open it up to you now. Um, where are our microphone holders? There they are. There she is. Two of them. Okay. So raise your hand if you'd like to ask a question or even make a comment about what you've heard. Um, this is a great, uh, this is an incredibly rich group of people here, not rich in money, rich in, in wisdom, um, well, that, you could, um, that you can ask uh, some questions. And here we go right here, somebody. You get, to get a microphone there. And if you would stand up, it's, I think it's easier for people to hear. Mm -hmm. And uh, say your name. Uh, my name is Carla Andrade. Uh, so I grew up in Climate Falls, and I have been potentially thinking about running for small, tiny, tiny office, you know, like little by little. But I, I, I honestly I don't know where to start because um, there's been so many things, you know, like running in my head about there's no Latino representation at all down there, at all whatsoever and there's so many like the population is so big um so a question that comes to mind is um how what type of of opportunities are there is is there some that are just specific to, to climate falls that that i can't i don't how do i put it like uh so what kind of opportunities are there that you know of that, that are similar to ones that are here in the Portland area? Because I, I, I feel like I live in both places. <laughs> um, because I grew up there, I go there constantly, but I, I live here. Um, and also, it might, might be a, a simple question. That, so I, I don't study politics or, or political science, but can I still run for something like that? Okay, who, wants to, who wants to start? I, I could start, just, uh, and, and, and certainly we can all uh, chime in, but I, I was down in Klamath Falls last, uh, I don't know, fall, spring, something, looking at some of the water issues down there. And, you know, I, I think what's important to recognize is that Oregon is, is both urban and rural, and we tend to forget the rural a lot. So it's important that, that we have people in Klamath Falls and Ontario and all over in these well, places that, but I would think about the fact that, you know, the issues are still the same. School funding, uh, housing, affordable housing, uh, jobs, uh, fair wages, all of those kinds of things are the same no matter where we're at. I, I, I guess the other thought I had though when, when you were speaking was that if you're gonna run for office, you also really, need to be able to analyze uh, uh, the, the district or the community you're gonna run in. A and you have to then think about, because Klamath Falls is a pretty conservative area, right? So how do you then approach the conservatism and, and still be successful as a candidate? Other thoughts, Serena? Well, I'd really encourage you to, to do Emerge. Have you heard about Emerge Oregon? So um, you did Emerge. Yep. Why don't you talk about Emerge, oh, Jessica? Okay. I don't need to talk about that. That's a good that. resource, too. You should do, yeah. Yeah, so, um, so well, but it is, <laughs> it is a great organization. So Emerge Oregon is, um, it's a training program for uh, women, Democratic women who want to run for office. It's people who have never run for anything before, who want to find out what, ex how do you do this? Like, and specifically, tactically, what do you need to consider about, um, it's, it's, um, once you have to apply to get into the program, they have a, a new class that's I think forming right now, um, and it's once a month for about nine or ten months, one one weekend, here in Portland, and sometimes they do that farther away. Um, and so you can go through that program, and it really teaches you um, what you need to in order to run for office. Um, but I know that's a big commitment. I think one of the things that as an organization um, I would like to see um, them do is to try to figure out how to make it less. Portland Metro centric because it's really hard for people who live outside the area and we've got a lot of community that we want to serve there. Um, so I, I mean, I was just thinking about this actually. Um, you know, it would be great to see if we had an event like this, like do this one day and maybe 
like the next day do an all day political training thing so that people here could also have the opportunity to just do a one day tra training of getting the basics of going for office. Um, I mean, so, so I think that we have to look at events that we're already holding and pe where people are already coming together and see how we can use those things to, um, to, to, to train um, more Latinos who want to run for office. Anybody, Olga, did you want to comment? I would encourage you to, if you don't live there, no, do you have family there? Do you have family, uh, friends there that, that may be influential, that um, you know, are strong, that are eager and, and uh, you know, have energy to, to join the school board, uh, you know, to learn about what's going on in the community? What are the issues that are impacting residents, that are impacting the community, and what are some ways that you can make your voice be heard? Um, you know, I've been in, in Hillsborough for over 20 years, but only been on council for you know, six years. So prior to that, you know, I educated myself um, around, you know, what are the issues, the struggles that my, the, the Latino community and my, the students that I work with are facing? Educational gap, you know, low achieving, dropout rates, parent engagement, all of those things, and then you look beyond that to make a, a bigger impact. And so talk to your friends, talk to family members, encourage them to get out there. And then Rena? The only other thing that I would add is just for you to think about what are your passions? What are you passionate about? What drives you to do what you do? Um, what do you feel like you have expertise in that you know, some, you know a lot about? Um, and those are things that will help you figure out what are the organizations, what are the, the levels of government that make most sense mm -hmm. to do. And that, then you'll learn about all of those different places when you do the training. But, but knowing that part about you in advance will really help you sort through all of the information, I think. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. I, I did. I did information management, technology, and philosophy. So, no. And what's your answer? Your <laughs> education, Joe, is on? Social work. Social work? Yeah. Olga? I did educational administration. So not necessary to have no. a political science degree at and, all. And I'm the one who was the least good at it. So. Right. <laughs> OK, another question. We have over here. Oh, OK, we're going over there. And then we'll come here to the woman in the orange, OK? Next. Um, so I have a. What's what, your name? My name is Jessica Arsate. Mm -hmm. And so I'm looking for advice. As someone who isn't native to Oregon, and I've recently moved here, and I'm completely emotional about being here, and I want this to be my home, and I feel more and more like I have been pulled to Oregon. So what kind of advice do you have someone who wants to get involved to legitimize my presence here and my own like political voice here? Okay. Yeah. So I'm yeah. happy yeah. to answer this one because, um, so when you were running, and I know you're talking about getting involved in running for office or getting involved in just getting involved in creating a, just getting involved? Getting involved and then potentially looking for getting involved in the process. Okay. So um, just, sh just show up someplace that, you're, that does something that you're interested in, whether it's like a neighborhood, uh, your, like your neighborhood um, association or a um, issue that you're really passionate about and, and like Sierra Club if it's an environment or a healthcare, you know, like some, some kind of healthcare. Um, get involved in a campaign. I mean, People need volunteers. My friend Joe needs volunteers <laughs> to come out and I mean, there are lots of opportunities. Yeah, Danielle's like, yes, <laughs> Joe needs volunteers. So he can, you can come out and walk for Joe and get, in, get hooked up with his campaign. I mean, there are lots of opportunities. You just have to kind of sh like show up at a meeting and talk to people. And I would just think, find out what you're interested in and then, and then get involved that way. Um, we actually hire a lot of people for our staff who are campaign workers. I mean, so, you know, for people in that, um, I would just like to take a minute to introduce Anna, who is my <laughs> legislative assistant. So she's um, um, she's fantastic. And um, but I but I did want to. The reason I want to answer your question is because I'm not from um, Oregon. I was um, born in uh, Northwest Indiana, and I went to school in Chicago. And so when you run for office, a lot of times you'll have people say, "I'm a fifth generation Oregonian. My people came over on the Oregon Trail." I mean, like you hear that a lot. <laughs> it's a really nice story to be able to tell when you're running for office, but not everybody can tell that story. <laughs> so, um, so there are different ways of, of telling your story. Um, it doesn't really matter. I mean, 
half the people who live in, I'm just making this up a little bit, but half the people from Oregon aren't actually from Oregon. If you talk to people, I mean, people are from a lot of other places around this country and outside this country. Joe? Yeah, I'd like to add, did you know uh, my family was one of the first? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> of course they were. Ser <laughs> seriously, uh, you know, the other thing is, uh, uh, I left, I left uh, Portland, I left Oregon to teach at San Diego State, University of Washington, et cetera. And I was gone for like 15 years and then came back. And the only way I could get back into things, I, I volunteered for everything. I mean, I volunteered with uh, the social work organization, I volunteered for United Way, I volunteered for all kinds of things. But, but again, that's how you begin to network again. And it's networking knowing people in different places and so on that, that sort of gets you then connected again. Anybody else want to respond to that one? Okay. So that, uh, oh. Actually, oh, oh, oh. I did, did uh, talk about that earlier that I had a hard time saying no. Mm -hmm. So you initially need to start saying yes to things. <laughs> <laughs> then say no. <laughs> then say no, right. <laughs> Okay, yes, please introduce yourself. Hi, my, my name is Gloria Pinzone. I'm a student at PSU. Um, and my question is, there's a lot of youth here, um, as well as a lot of experienced people, um, and I was wondering if you guys could give us some pointers about interpersonal communication um, and the skills that you need for interpersonal communication, because I feel like running for anything, being professional at anything, you need those skills, and there's a lot of youth here, and I think that um, it would be very useful for them to hear some pointers about that. Like to start, Joe? I'll, I'll start. I, you know, I mentioned the American Leadership Forum the other, the, uh, earlier, and, and one of the skills with regard to leadership that, that we talk about in that organization is listening, and, and how often, you know, we're at, at meetings or whatever, and we're not listening. We're, we're thinking, about, oh, what am I going to say? What am I going to say? What am I going to say? And you're reloading, you know, rather than really listening to what somebody else is saying and listening to what they have to say, uh, and that's just that is a skill that you have to develop. Um, so that, that's one thing I would think mm -hmm. about. Yes. And, while you're mm -hmm. and while you're listening, looking for those points of commonality, looking for those places where you share interests, share ideas, share perspectives, because that's the place where you can build um, things to, to meet. Mm -hmm. okay. Jessica or Olga? Yeah. Olga? In, in addition to the listening, uh, that is huge. Uh, people need to feel that, that they are being listened to and that you actually care about their issues. Um, I would say that, uh, you know, in addition, in addition to listening, um, take that risk to speak your truth. Don't be afraid to speak your truth. Oftentimes we'll think of something, we don't know if it's a great idea or not, and because that we have that doubt, we often just don't say anything. Um, you're not just going to go out there and just say things like crazy. You make sure that you also have some background knowledge around what your passions are, what you know about the issue that you're, you know, wanting to speak about. Is there some research behind that? Uh, is it impacting somebody, you know, a community, a sector of your community in, in a negative way? Um, re so, you know, before you say it, of course, have some background there, but no, don't, don't be afraid, take that risk. Okay. And Jessica. I think mm -hmm. the, just the last thing I would add um, about interpersonal communication, so I always go back to a piece of advice that um, the House Majority Leader, Val Hoyle, um, tells us when we're in our caucus, that's when we're like sitting, all the House Democrats are sitting in a room, and Joe will back me up, it gets a little heated in there when we're talking about our bills and the things that we want to um, accomplish. Um, she always says, um, assume best intentions. Um, as things get stressful, as things move quickly, and this happens in politics, but in any, any job and pretty much any marriage, you know, <laughs> um, just assume, assume the best intention of the person that you're talking to because that, otherwise, um, there are a lot of um, assumptions that can be made about that aren't necessarily true. So assume best intentions, and then, um, and that really, I find, helps, um, helps you have a, uh, a, a positive conversation. Okay, well, other questions? Right here we have, uh, no, you're gonna, you, you get a microphone just like everybody else. <laughs> just uh, two questions. What has been your biggest challenge 
um, or is your biggest challenge and how have you accomplished them or are um, on the steps to, to, to overcome those challenges? I think that's really important for um, us um, that we are in, in the same path, um, but it's important to hear from you that you already have, uh, are, or have been in those positions. Okay, your challenges and how you overcame them. Um, so Jessica. I think, yeah, I'll just, um, the challenges, the biggest challenge for me is always work-life balance. It's, it's, a bit, it's, you know, being um, married and having two young kids and, and, um, and being the best mom and wife that I can be, but also being the best state legislature, state legislator that I can be. And so it's finding the balance and, and like kind of last of all, is that making time for yourself, right? Because that is very important. And so it's how to balance all of that stuff. That's the thing that I've, um, you know, since the campaign, it's always a struggle. And um, I think the second thing is learning how to say no, um, because that's, you do get asked a lot to, to do things. And there's so many really important, great issues that are out there to work on um, and be a champion for. And it's like, how do you say no so that you can accomplish those things that, um, that, that, that you do have the time and energy and passion to, to be successful on those things that you can handle? So I think it's, it's saying no and balancing things. Yeah. I mean, I, I think a good example of a challenge is, is my district, for example, that is really uh, very diverse. I mean, we have uh, the, the tech industries in my district as well as a, a significant uh, portion of farm industry, uh, or farms, I should say. And, and so, you know, you've got very different kinds of, of issues that arise from these two, these constituent groups. And then how do you then sort of uh, facilitate and manage and find balance between these things. So that's been a challenge. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I, I feel like elections um, have been my biggest challenges. So my first